So thank you for coming back. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, now introducing just briefly the next panel, track it the tracking dictators, uh, diving for leaks and opening up sensitive data. And uh, I have to say that unfortunately, Natalia Sedeczka is not here with us because of a family loss. So unfortunately, we don't have uh, her cause brought to us and uh, we greet her from the stream and we are really sorry she's not uh, with us today. But I want to call on stage uh, the moderator of this panel, uh, Shannon Cunningham, and also Emmanuel Freudenthal. And uh, we will have also later MC Matt Graz and Brennan Novak, but since they also care a lot about their privacy, uh, they are not uh, now on stage with us because they don't want to be filmed or streamed. Uh, so we respect that and uh, they will appear later. <laughs> uh, but I now introduce Shannon and I thank you so much for being here. Shannon is an American freelance investigative journalist, researcher and writer covering issues of data privacy, social media and geopolitics for German public media. Shannon also works to bring free software projects to broader audience through accessible communications. She studies sociology and information study at the University of Texas in Austin. Thank you very much for being with us and I leave the stage to you and Emmanuel. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Emmanuel Freudenthal. Sorry, my notes. Uh, Emmanuel Freudenthal is a freelance reporter based in Nairobi who's been conducting investigations across Africa for a decade. Two of his corruption investigations that used public documents, such as financial reports and court judgments, have led to police inquiries in Australia and Canada. He's also crunched data to calculate that Cameroon's president, Paul Bia, has spent four and a half years on private trips abroad. As part of a BBC team, he won a Peabody Award for an open source investigation of soldiers who murdered two women and children while filming themselves on a smartphone. His stories have been published by the BBC, Le Mans, Sydney Morning Herald, the Daily Telegraph and others. So we are very excited to hear from him. And please give a warm welcome to Emmanuel Freudenthal. Hi, um, thanks for um, coming. So I'm gonna present our work with a dictator alert um, and um, tell you a bit about, about this, uh, this project. So, uh, first of all, I'll tell you uh, what um, data, uh, what we got from the, well, the stories that, we, that were made with the, with the data we got. Um, then I'll tell you what data <laughs> we're talking about and how we collected it. And then uh, other avenues to investigate that data. And throughout this, we'll uh, look at how, um, how citizens are involved in, in this process. So, um, what data, what, what am I actually talking about? Um, well, uh, as a joke, you could say that uh, our mission is informing the um, uh, families of uh, dictators when, um, when the leaders of dictatorships uh, arrive at uh, Geneva Airport. So we do it because we don't have the contact details. We actually do it on Twitter. Um, so we have a, a Twitter bot, which is a Twitter account um, that tweets every time uh, an aircraft owned by dictatorship lands or takes off from, uh, from the Geneva airport. So how do we define dictators? This is, uh, uh, we use an economist uh, democracy index, uh, which um, has a, basically ranks country by how, um, how democratic they are. So every time a non-democratic country, um, the own aircraft owned or used by a non-democratic country lands or takes off from Geneva, this, this uh, Twitter bot tweets automatically. So here you can see uh, uh, the uh, Qatar and uh, UAE uh, governments have uh, landed in, in Geneva. 
So I'll tell you about three different stories that were, that were done using, using this uh, Twitter bot. Uh, quite recently, um, uh, Bouteflika, the former president of Algeria, arrived in Geneva to, to seek health treatment. This was in March. And uh, Twitter bot tweeted about it. And at the same time, there were uh, protests in Algeria. And so what happened is that people suddenly realized the leader of the country is actually away uh, seeking treatment because he's quite aged. Uh, he he's been in power since uh, 1963, so it was like well before I was born. Um, and, <clears throat> and so soon after that, he, uh, he lost power, basically he got kicked out. So obviously this is not directly linked uh, because of the Twitter bot, but the, the, this definitely made people aware that their, their leader was not in the, in the kind of good health to, to still be able to run the country. So the, uh, another uh, dictator basically took uh, the position of number two, went up one rank in the longest uh, serving um, uh, head of state in the world, and this was uh, Paul Bia of Cameroon. So, uh, so Paul Bia is, is um, quite a regular uh, visitor to, uh, to Geneva. He goes there uh, several times every year. Um, some, some years he spent more than a third of the year in, in Geneva uh, rather than at home. And in Geneva, it's private visit. They call it a brief private visit abroad. But sometimes these brief private visits can last up to uh, one month. So using the Twitter bot and as well as uh, newspaper clipping, we uh, calculated how, how uh, long uh, Paul Beer uh, was uh, staying in Geneva. And over the 37 years that he's been in Paris, since 1982, he's spent uh, over at least two, uh, four and a half years on these uh, private trips abroad, a lot of them in Geneva. The first trip that he did to uh, Germany in 1985 was to meet, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to pronounce it really badly, uh, Richard von Weissesacker. Um, so <laughs> it's a just to give you an idea of the kind of time frame this uh, president is, is dealing with. And uh, after that, he took an uh, eight-day uh, holiday. And this is often what he does. He'll just go for an for, um, official visit, and then on the end of the visit, he will spend uh, maybe a week in Geneva or something like that. In 1990, he came here to meet uh, Helmut Kohl, then took another six-day holiday. Um, so to calculate exactly how much time he spent in Geneva, we used uh, these covers from, these are covers from the national uh, newspaper called the Cameroon Tribune. And so every time he goes abroad, it's on the cover of the newspaper. And every time he comes back, uh, it's also on the cover. But you can see um, this on the left there, it, um, when I think he, met, uh, he went to uh, meet uh, Helmut Kohl. So it's, it's a big cover. Uh, about his trip to Bonn, and then the, when he comes back, because at the end of that trip he, he, he took a holiday, so that, the cover is much uh, smaller, it's on the bottom right there. Um, our uh, calculations were not uh, very welcome in Cameroon by the government. Uh, we, uh, this is um, the, to the, uh, this side is a cover that, um, was made about us, <laughs> uh, having done the investigation, is uh, here are the criticizers, uh, that's why it says. Uh, so it was a nice, uh, we basically closed the loop with, uh, with that newspaper, having uh, had the, inf the data from it and then ending up in the newspaper as well. Um, so how, how do we know uh, which aircraft are used by uh, these dictatorships? Um, they don't really advertise that. So we basically collect uh, about 200 different aircrafts now that are used by a dictatorship, such as Cameroon or, um, uh, or Algeria. And uh, one way we do it is uh, with social media. So social media, uh, you probably know it as something like this. Um, this is the original sound. Uh, this is the son of President uh, Obiang. Um, he has quite a good lifestyle. 
Uh, <laughs> this is uh, him like um, a few weeks ago. He got reunited with, um, with a boat that he had uh, seized by uh, Switzerland for uh, troubles in justifying how he found the funds to, uh, to uh, pay for the boat. Uh, so his father, uh, so he's vice president, and his father is the president, uh, which I'm sure he was um, promoted to that job because of his skills. Uh, <laughs> His, uh, his father has been in power since 1979, and he's the number one uh, longest serving head of state at the moment, uh, just in front of beer. But so, on, in addition to his holidays and expensive toys, he's also uh, advertising this kind of stuff. So you can see here um, his, uh, his private plane. So he has a bunch of private planes, actually, that he uses, and that's one of them. So you can see on the back, uh, you can't see it anymore, but. On the back of the plane, there's a, a number, and that's called a tail number. And with that number, you can, uh, you can uh, know which plane he's, use it, he's using based on his social media. Um, so now, how, you know, how do we know whether this plane has come to Geneva? Obviously, I'm not in Geneva standing there waiting for uh, planes, trying to uh, writing down the numbers and uh, then tweeting. Um, so the way we've done it is thanks to this guy. Uh, his name is Mike Jared, and he actually doesn't care so much about a dictatorship. Uh, what he cares a lot is uh, about the noise uh, of the planes, because he, he's retired. He's an engineer, I think. And he had enough with planes making uh, too much noise in Geneva. So what he did was uh, set up an antenna that uh, grabs the information from the planes and then grabs the noise levels. And he, he, uh, he has a website, basically, that will uh, tell you which plane uh, landed at what time and how much noise they made. And so he, uh, he worked with a colleague of mine who started this Twitter bot called uh, Francois Pilet. So Francois Pillet uh, got in touch with this guy. This guy was really keen, uh, Francois tells me this guy was really keen to uh, have a story made about the noise, but Francois uh, never actually did that story. He was more interested in the dictatorships. Um, so how does it, how does uh, uh, Mac Dare, uh, this guy, detect the planes? It's, it's um, a system called ADSB. Has anyone heard of that? Show of hands, one person. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to explain it. OK, so <laughs> only two people. Um, well, it's actually a very common uh, system. It's to avoid planes crashing into each other, which is uh, quite useful. Um, and what they do is they broadcast their location, GPS location, as well as uh, details such as their registration and uh, uh, like that tail number. The, the immatriculation, it's like a car number plate, but for a plane. Uh, so they broadcast it unencrypted, um, meaning uh, that anyone with a, an, an antenna can just you know, tune in, just like a radio, but it's a, it's a different antenna. But it's not, these antennas are quite cheap, actually. So you can get uh, an antenna like this one for like 10 bucks, and then uh, detect the signals that is sent by, by the planes. Um, you can then connect it to a Raspberry Pi via some, um, it's called SDR, this USB thing, um, and uh, basically just monitor all the planes that are uh, flying above you. Um, so it's just like a radio, like a, your normal FM radio, except it tracks planes and all the things as well, but mostly uh, we're interested in planes at the moment. Um, so now, as, as I've told you, the, the Twitter bot is only for, uh, for Geneva at the moment. And so because, because of Mike Jarrett, um, this guy who doesn't like noise, uh, so we've, we've been wanting to, um, to track it uh, over the whole world, and maybe some of you have seen um, this kind of uh, website where you can track all of the planes. Um, anyone? We've we seen this? A few people? Okay. Um, so, 
um, how this, this information is done, um, collected, basically on the location of all these planes. Uh, it's about 200,000 planes a day on, on this uh, website, uh, FlightAware. Um, and there's other ones like flight radar and uh, radar box. Uh, the information is actually uh, collected through, through various means, but one of the key ways that they do it is with these antennas that are installed by just uh, hobbyists, you know, people who are into planes uh, all over the world. And then they uh, bring all this data together to build this kind of, uh, this kind of maps. So you could think, okay, why don't we just use this data or those maps to, to track dictatorships? But actually the problem is that, uh, well, first of all, the first problem is that these websites are actually businesses and they'll sell that data, I mean, uh, for anywhere from 3,000 to 20,000 for one week worth of data. Uh, so that's obviously not, uh, that's beyond our means um, as freelance journalists. But the other problem is the planes that we're looking at for is actually not on that map, most of them. And uh, the reason is because they're blocked. And that's because these websites, they don't show any of the military planes and they don't show uh, a lot of the private planes. This is um, a study by the uh, University of Oxford researchers. And they've... Um, done a sample in Europe to see how many of the planes, um, for how many of the planes you could figure out um, the location and, and to find them. So uh, in, in, uh, in gray, you can see they're on the block list. So I'll explain a bit more about the block list, but basically they might get the data, but they don't actually um, uh, show it. Uh, so you can see on the left, all, almost all of the military planes are on the block list, and then some of them even turn off the ADSB. So that um, equipment in the plane that is um, emitting that data that we're grabbing with with those antennas, so they just turn it off. Which obviously, for a civilian, it's uh, completely illegal to do that, so they don't do it. But the military uh, plane, it's okay for them to do that. So. Um, so you can see actually the, the planes that are visible is, is a quite, a small, quite a small percentage. Uh, and as journalists, we're not super uh, interested in you know, the um, uh, Brussels Airlines from Paris to Nairobi because it's, it goes every day and like, it's kind of boring. Um, you don't really want to report that it's five minutes late or that 10 minutes early. Um, we're interested in in Obiang and Bia and Bouteflika, these kind of guys, who of course, if you have a private plane and you're one of these guys, you don't really want people to be tracking you. Uh, and so what you do is you ask those websites not to track you, which actually is really easy. Um, this is uh, the list. You can't really see it, but this is actually numbers, uh, immatriculation number, uh, tail numbers. So um, they are written at the back of the planes that uh, have registered not to be tracked in the US. This is called the FAA BARR bar list. Um, so it's about 25,000, over 25,000 aircraft. And those are just a private aircraft. The military, uh, American military aircraft are automatically not showing up on, on, on any of these websites. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's 25,000 out of about 200,000 aircraft. So it's a substantial amount. Um, you can actually request this list by a freedom of information request. Um, so that's how I got it. In the EU, as far as I can tell, there is no such list. So you actually don't know uh, which, which plane doesn't, doesn't show up on the, um, on the website and which planes uh, do because every website will manage their own thing and there's no such list. So it's, it's even more opaque uh, to know uh, the planes that don't show up. So what uh, a solution is, is to install our own antennas that we control so we can grab all of the data from all those planes and uh, use it however we like. Uh, so 
that sounds kind of simple in a way because you, you, know, you can just install these antennas everywhere, but it's actually a bit more complicated because you actually have to physically go and install, uh, install those antennas. These uh, specific antennas, which you can see a little bit on this photo, um, they're, um, they're a bit bigger, but it's basically the same thing. And these ones, the small ones, work quite well. So this year, with uh, support from uh, um, the OCCRP, we've uh, installed a bunch of antennas in Africa, which is one of the areas that we actually don't have very good coverage. And we're, uh, we've also collaborated with a website called ADSB Exchange. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a sec. Um, so all these antennas are you know, hosted by, uh, by citizens, just regular people, I guess. Um, just like Mike Derrid, but uh, usually they, they do it because they believe in the project. Um, and because you can't really alter the data, it doesn't really matter if that person is a political opponent of, of uh, uh, someone in power or, you know, um, it doesn't really matter what they think about the data because the data just gets collected and, and then uh, we can just use it. The data is objective in a way. Um, although sometimes, uh, uh, or at least one antenna I didn't install myself, but it would, it would turn off at uh, just the right time <laughs> for some aircraft uh, to come in. So it depends, you have to at least know that the antenna is gonna be online. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is uh, partners involved in, the, in that project. Um, and basically the system is a dictator alert is gonna be now expanded to the whole world um, as of next week, hopefully, uh, where you'll be able to track dictators all over the world, no matter where they are, not just in Geneva. And that, uh, we, we're gonna be using data that is collected by ADSB Exchange. We'll have antennas all over the world. Um, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll manage to scale it and, and do investigations using that data and expand it uh, as, as long as we find funding to do that. So this data, it's obviously you collect data from every plane, not just dictatorship. So, so our website is just gonna show dictatorship um, but, but you can get data and, uh, from, from all the planes. And so when you go on the ADSB Exchange website, you can see uh, unfiltered data from, from uh, every plane that they've uh, ever uh, detected. But uh, we have one uh, quite big issue, is it's a lot of data. Um, it's been, so, so ADSB Exchange started, I think, 2017, and they already have 14 billion positions. So all these little messages that the planes are sending to say where they are, they have 14 billion of those. That's uh, about 300,000 uh, yeah, 300, planes, terabytes of data, and every year it's, it's over 250 gigabytes. So it's like a, a, a huge, um, amount of information, and so the problem is not so much to collect, it. well, the problem is to collect the data, installing the antenna and so on, but once you have it, you know, what do you do with it? Because to go and find that one plane that is interesting, unless you're looking for one of the dictators we've listed, is actually quite difficult. And so there's a few uh, options. One is uh, to use citizens, maybe. I mean, this, this uh, workshop is about that, uh, and so we use them to collect data, and you know we use them also in a way to hold the leaders accountable, uh, like like was mentioned in the um, in the presentation, the panel earlier on. But at the same time, there's a bit of a so it's not so simple for this specific type of, of data because it's a huge amount of data. So first of all, you have to get it to the person, and then it's you know. Not everyone can surf through 14 billion um, locations, so it's actually a bit hard to analyze that data as well. 
And at the same time, even when you know that, you know, Paul Bia went to Geneva, it's like this is not really a story in itself. So you also need a way to make it more interesting. Uh, another, um, and I'm being a bit negative there, but another issue is there's a lot of rumor and exaggeration. So, for example, over the past um, year, or like earlier this year, there's so many rumors about Paul Bia going to Geneva with this and that plane, because it doesn't... He himself, the president of Cameroon, doesn't have a plane because um, he wanted to buy one, but uh, basically um, his, uh, his staff, uh, so it's a very corrupt country, and his staff actually uh, took a bit too much of a cut, and so they just got an old plane repainted, and then he almost crashed and killed him. So after that, he decided he'd better uh, you know, uh, rent the planes. Uh, so every time he uses a different plane, not every time, but he uses lots of different planes, and there's so many rumors he's going to use this plane, he's going to use that plane. Um, and people exaggerate, like you, you read in certain places that he spends, you know, all his life in Geneva, or, you know, most of his, and actually it's not true. So, so that's another uh, limitation of using um, citizens for the investigative part of, 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 uh, of this process. At the same time, I'm, I'm quite open, maybe we'll discuss it during the panel, but uh, two ideas of how, how to do that. Other way we've um, looked at the data uh, is, is to match different databases. So obviously the, the, one where we, the one we use for the Twitter bot is to match the planes database with um, the database of the known planes of this dictatorship. So, this, this is already something we're doing, but there's other databases that you can match. Um, you can use tip-offs, and, and another uh, interesting way to analyze this data is, is uh, through algorithms. Um, and since I have just enough time, I can, I can uh, talk to you a little bit about that. This is a um, work by uh, BuzzFeed we've done a really great job. So what they did is actually use flight radar data. So, so that website I showed you earlier that filters data. And they tracked, they mapped the path of, I can't remember how many, but basically all of the airplanes that they could. And uh, to try and figure out which of those, plane, plane, which of those planes are uh, spy planes. And uh, sometimes those pipelines are actually really easy to spot because they, um, you'll see them on the radar and instead of having a, like a normal number plate uh, like PC4LC, they'll have AAAAA and you're like, oh, that looks a bit weird. <laughs> so, so you can spot them. But in this specific case, the pipelines actually had reused uh, numbers or immatriculation numbers of, of um, other older planes. So you could see like suddenly there's a, there's a drone and it flies like, like as fast as a plane. So you can think, okay, there's something a bit funny going. Um, but what they did is they trained an algorithm to look for this kind of circular um, patterns which you see behind me. Uh, obviously if you're, uh, you know, if, you've, um, if you have a private plane, you're not just going to be going around circles above a military base all day long. You know, it seems quite unlikely. So this is how they spotted those planes. Uh, and they spotted a bunch of those and revealed that there's a lot of uh, surveillance going on in, in the U.S., much more than, um, than you might think. Uh, what happened after that is that now all of the planes, these planes have been removed, so you can't actually track them anymore with the flight radar website, but you can still... Uh, track them with the uh, ADSB exchange website, which is an unfiltered one. Uh, so th this is quite a, an advanced way to use the data, and we'll see this, uh, w uh, after we launch and we, um, we have this uh, uh, worldwide tracking of dictators uh, from next week, we'll see how citizens appropriate that data and use it. And uh, I'm, I'm quite curious to see how it's going. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Manuel, for it. All right, uh, coming to the stage, we have uh, Brennan Novak and MC McGrath for Transparency Toolkit. 
So Brennan Novak and MC McGrath build free software to collect and analyze open data from a variety of sources, working with investigative journalists and human rights organizations to turn that into useful, actionable knowledge. Currently, their primary focuses are investigating surveillance and human rights abuses. So they use open data to map the intelligence community and uncover secret surveillance programs to help investigate human rights abuses and find perpetrators. They are making it easier for non-technical people to collect and analyze this data, including myself. Full disclosure, I've been a very avid user of uh, transparency toolkit uh, data sets in my own research. So. Uh, I think we're in for quite a treat with this uh, talk. So please help me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Brennan Novak and MC McGrath of Transparency Toolkit. Hello. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, so we're actually going to present uh, something that we've been working on, and we're calling it the Archive Network. Um, Uh, the clicker is not working. Um, so starting with the Library of Alexandria, um, show of hands, like, did it burn to the ground, right? That's kind of understood as like a history, or at least it was to me until yesterday when, you know, I was putting together this slide. And there's a lot of information out there that says it didn't actually burn to the ground. Some scrolls in it burned to the ground, but not the whole thing. Um, however, last year, the uh, National Museum of Brazil did burn to the ground. Uh, it, there was about like 200 million rare artifacts and documents and things in it, and about 92.5% of those things are lost forever. And there was a lot of outrage about this, in Brazil especially, and internationally. And um, both of these are, um, I'm showing these to illustrate the point of uh, centralization of information and knowledge that we collect throughout like history and the dangers of having this centralized in one place. Um, however, there are benefits of, of centralizing information. Um, Gutenberg's printing press was obviously a huge uh, leap forward where we could replicate information. So there wasn't just one scroll, but there was you know, books and there could be many different libraries around the world um, that had the same information. Um, but again, libraries have a sort of centralizing effect, and um, we're going to get into uh, what we're working on towards this. Yeah, so while information needs to be decentralized in order to be resilient against censorship, um, it's also a bit of a problem because information needs to be centralized enough that people can go to one place and sort through it and use it for things. Um, so one example of a case where information was too decentralized to start with was the publication of the Snowden documents. There were many different media organizations that were sort of independently publishing stories and sometimes publishing the documents along with the stories, but they were all on many different websites. And I was hearing from people, even people who were working on some of these, that it was difficult to find the information that had been published already and use it in their research just because it was spread all over the place and there was no central repository of information. So um, to fix this, in about 2014, we started developing this database, um, searchable database of the Snowden documents, just to um, make it easier for people to search through the published data. And we weren't the only ones who did this. There was also a um, Canadian group of um, journalists and academics that built their own um, searchable uh, database of the Snowden documents. So this is a pretty common um, issue that other people were noticing. And it's common with many different data sets because there's there have been more large leaks and hacks and situations where people have just had to collect data from all over the internet and publish it in one place. People have needed tools to make it searchable and accessible, um, increasingly so. so. Um, this was uh, actually presented at a disruption lab a few months ago. Um, it was a, a sort of uh, created by a journalistic group, activist group called Unicorn Riot, and there was people who had infiltrated some alt-right uh, chat groups on the platform Discord, and they built this custom search interface that had a lot of similarities to our platform or the previous Snowden one that allowed you to search by different facets or terms or, or um, queries like this to find specific groups and what they're talking about. Um, this was like a one-off thing that they, they built, and I'm not sure if they're still working on the software or not, but um, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, 
Yeah, so there have been a lot of cases where people have needed to build databases like this in the initial when they're working on stories about data, when they just have documents to see what it's about. But there's also a need to preserve information long term because even if there's a great journalist who thinks they found all the stories in a large data set, that just can't be the case because people from different countries or with different backgrounds will see different things in the information and come up with new stories. And there's also just the simple fact that even a large group of people can't predict the future. And documents can gain new relevance in light of future events. So it's important to have information accessible long term for this reason, in accessible in a centralized way where people can easily find it to connect the dots with new things that have happened. Um, one really nice example of this um, has to do with the hacking team data. In uh, summer of 2015, there was a um, hack and uh, about 400 gigabytes of data from this company called Hacking Team was posted online. It's an Italian company that makes malware that's used by um, various governments around the world, including some who use it to spy on journalists and activists. Um, so this was important to have in a searchable and accessible format. So shortly after it came out, a bunch of people downloaded the data and mirrored it and tried to make it searchable. Um, some of those instances have gone down, but some of them are still online and available. Um, but this take on a new relevance in 2018, um, last year, when a uh, journalist was murdered in the uh, Saudi embassy in Istanbul. Um, and because in the aftermath of this, a few journalists realized that one of the people who helped coordinate this murder um, had been corresponding with hacking team three years I earlier. Um, and this is particularly significant because there are reports of the Saudi government using malware to spy on associates of Khashoggi and uh, also to spy on journalists who were reporting on the murder after the fact. Uh, so, but this was only possible for journalists to make this connection and find this email in the hacking team data because it was still accessible and online over three years later. Um, so there can be cases like this. So while it's important to build long-term public searchable archives of data, it's still quite cumbersome, even though people regularly do it for significant data sets like this. Um, many of the archives we've described and many of the ones that have been built over the last decade or so um, were built with software that was either custom to the data set or was modified and customized to work with a specific data set. So there can be a huge amount of work that goes into it. Um, and this isn't really is something that really can be avoided because people are often building the same sorts of software every time that they need to work on making a data set accessible like this. So we've been, um, when we were working on the Snowden document search, we also were working on a project called IC Watch where we had, we're scraping these um, LinkedIn profiles from different websites. Uh, or well, we're scraping LinkedIn profiles and also other resumes of people in the intelligence community who um, were working on surveillance programs or drone programs or um, torture and the like. And they were just talking about these in their resumes. So we wanted to make this data accessible to people. And we realized that we could use the same software that we had used to make the Snowden documents more accessible to also make this, um, these documents searchable. So we generalized it to work first with this data set and then any sort of machine readable JSON data set. And then we started building more tools to make it easier for people to import um, data like this. So things where people can just upload data and it OCRs the documents to extract the text and makes a database of it just from that. Um, so this saves the effort of having to constantly rebuild or customize um, search software for each data set. Um, we're not the only ones who have built software like this. There are a few other projects. Um, this is um, Aleph, it's a project that OCCRP has been working on that has some similar functionalities. So there are a few projects like this that have been recognizing this as sort of a common issue and trying to address it. But uh, it still doesn't fully solve the problem because while well, generalizing software to work with many different data sets um, can make it more, can help make, can help people make archives. I mean, we can make archives now that would take months or weeks and days or hours. So it helps a lot, but it still requires some sort of technical expertise and it requires server infrastructure and people need to be able to set all of this up themselves. And that's something that just like an independent researcher or a group of activists um, or a freelance journalist may not have. So we're trying to um, fix that situation a bit. And we sort of encountered this problem because after we started building these databases, a lot of people started coming to us asking for help um, making data more accessible. And we couldn't really work with all of them, but um, we'll talk about some of the ones we did. Like um, after the hacking team stuff, we had done an email database that um, was not using our current uh, platform, but um, 
Netspolitik. Um, we worked with them researching this, uh, or allowing them to research. Um, AGT, which is an uh, advanced German technology, it was a German shell corporation used by um, uh, malware companies to skirt export regulations and things like this. Um, but it, they had a bunch of emails to look through and, and they wanted something that they could collaborate uh, with Privacy International and other um, uh, people that were not all in the same physical space. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there have been some groups that just wanted internal databases that they could use to um, write reports but didn't want to publish the data, so we've helped with that in some cases. Um, and then also in other cases, um, we also worked with Privacy International on a database called the Surveillance Industry Index where they had this data from uh, private uh, companies that were building uh, surveillance uh, tools, sometimes hardware, sometimes software, and um, selling it to various governments. Uh, and they had this database of the brochures from these companies and details about them. The data had been online, had gone offline, and they wanted help just going it, having it go, um, getting it back online so that it could be a resource that many different people could use. Um, so we, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so we heard from a lot of people who wanted help also in some cases collecting data, um, in addition to just making data sets they already had accessible. Um, so sometimes these are scraping projects, but in some cases the data needed to be collected manually, often by a group of people that was um, geographically distributed. Um, so one example of this is a data politics, um, which I think was mentioned briefly in a talk last year here, um, which is a database about um, political, um, marketing companies, things like Cambridge Analytica, um, but broadly spread. Um, and so a lot of this data, some of it was automatically collected, but some of it was also um, manually input. And there's not really a great tool to manually collect data sets as a group at this point. Uh, you can use Google Docs, but that has privacy concerns and censorship concerns and it's not really a great format to present to people in the end. So we started building tools where people can just easily input data on companies or people that they're investigating and add that to a database along with documents. Um, so we um, started to do that and we can only, we, there's a limit to the number of archives that we can help with. So we decided that we wanted to find a way to make this software accessible to everyone in a hosted archiving service. But this leads to back to the issue uh, with the burning of libraries where it becomes overly centralized and that becomes a problem in and of itself. So sort of in parallel, as we were working on these projects, we started getting um, people started trying to take down the data that we had been publishing. Uh, so with IC Watch, we started getting death threats and legal threats, cease and desist letters, um, trying to get us to take the data down. Um, and also with the hacking team data as well, we had similar threats and even last year, three years after, after the data was published, our domain name was suspended for a while um, due to hosting this data until we ended up having to switch to a different registrar for this. Um, so this is a pretty regular occurrence and it seems to be a common widespread problem. Um, people have different ways of dealing with this at the moment. Um, for a lot of hacks that are posted online. Sometimes people post it on torrents and get lots of people download it. There's also a trend where people post um, each individual document on a PDF sharing site. And um, sometimes they post them on a few different sites and just hope that at least one of them will stay up. But this makes it really difficult to download all the different documents and go through it. And it's sort of a gamble to see if it stays online. And even when people can distribute data enough that it is, um, possible to, uh, that, it, that it doesn't go down in the short term. Some of these data sets, even the very widespread ones, are in danger of being taken offline a few years down the line. Um, so it's still a bit of a problem. Um, so we ended up dealing sort of two contradictory problems. How to collect data in one place and make it accessible on the one hand, and on the other hand, how to decentralize it so that it isn't vulnerable um, to disappearing from the internet. So for the first um, goal, um, we have already sort of built out many different tools for making it easy to build archives um, so that people can upload documents, have the text extracted, have them loaded into a searchable database, and um, publish the data and have tools for sorting through them. Um, so there's sort of a chart here of the different pipeline we have laid out with our software um, and how it works to help uh, people publish uh, information. Um, and so we are, we're in the process of making a hosted archiving service where people can just go in their browser with documents and upload them and it automatically generates a searchable database 
and they can choose if they want to, they can choose to share it with people privately. They, there are text mining tools to help extract entities and other things from the data. They can manually add their notes into the database and then they can publish some of the data if they choose. They can publish a subset of it so that anyone can access it. Um, so this sort of solves the problem of helping people make data more accessible, but we still need to find a way to decentralize it because the problem with this is we run the risk of becoming a single point of failure um, where people can just go after us and have data taken down. So what the, we're doing is not just building a hosted archiving service, but rather a network of hosted archiving services. Uh, so at the moment, we're in the process of starting different um, companies um, as independently as possible in different jurisdictions around the world, um, as politically diverse as possible. Um, and we're planning on having the data mirrored between between the different instances um, to create a setup where people actually can take data down if they're seriously pressured to, but it still stays online within the service somewhere else as long as it's diversified enough. Um, so we wanted to show you a walkthrough of the general tools that we're working on. Um, this, we don't have internet, so we can't do a live demo. We did a few months ago, but um, it would be, yeah, but just a note that all the things that you'll see are real screenshots of something that's online that you can use. They're not mock-ups or anything like that. So it starts, um, there's a basic user login sort of thing. If you have an account, you log in. If you don't, you create it. Uh, we don't require email, uh, anybody to put in an email address if you're working with something sensitive and you want to maintain a little bit more uh, privacy. Um, once you log in, you kind of get started, and, and uh, there's going to be a little bit more of a tutorial that explains things in, in the future. Um, the first step is creating an archive. You, you pick a name. You, you pick, uh, it, it automatically suggests a subdomain of where this would live if you make it public. Um, description, you'll be able to choose a different theme. As you noticed, some of our previous work had different styles to it. Um, language, we're going to have multi-language support. And then once it's created, it kind of looks like this. And then you have different options. You, you can choose to upload documents, add entities, and, and various admin things that we'll come back to later. Um, so um, a little bit about the security model. Um, maybe MC wants. So when you um, create an archive, at first it's private and only you can view it and you can share it with people if you choose. Then there's a separate public archive that you can send the data to on a separate server. Um, but within the server where the archives are hosted, um, each one runs the, in its own virtual machine. So it's difficult to say upload documents to one archive and use it to somehow compromise a system to retrieve data from another one. Um, so everything is fairly isolated. Um, it's probably not perfect, and we want to test it a bit more before launching, but we're trying to create a fairly good model even for dealing with sensitive data sets via a system like this. We'll also be adding encryption of the archive uh, VM, so we don't have it yet, but we'll have it soon, so. Um, so then the next step is uploading documents. Um, you can bulk select um, as many as you want, um, and it starts automatically uploading them in the background, and you can actually upload um, numerous different types of things. Perhaps the coolest is like, uploading a zip file. If you were to upload a zip file of, say, a thousand emails, it'll go through and extract all the emails, and it'll extract all of the images that are attached to those emails, and then it'll start OCRing the contents of the images as well as the emails and um, starting to index that. Um, then it'll finish, and then within a few seconds, you start seeing items popping up in your private instance. Um, you see in the top uh, right corner, it says uh, th seven, and then it'll, it'll increase. Um, and, and, and soon you'll have all the documents you've uploaded, OCR'd, and everything. Um, and you can view the individual uh, documents that have been OCR'd here, like this, as well as like the source material. Uh, you, can, you can edit the documents if there's any like uh, cruft or artifacts or things weren't OCR'd correctly, um, as well as add notes and, and add categories and tags to a given document to help you organize. Um, and we also added the ability to add entities, um, which MCs used more than I have, so maybe you want to? Um... Sure. Well, so well, people are, um, if they have notes, if they are looking into just manually a particular person or a company, or if they have um, research notes that maybe they got from an interview or some data that they can't upload as a document, um, it just allows manually adding and sharing data. Um, so it makes it easy to build crowdsource databases that lots of people are contributing to. Um, so people could also use it to, so they can add different tags to categorize the entities and just to organize their research as a group. 
and and that's pretty straightforward. But we're we're still refining um, the sort of fields and links and things within entities. Um, this is one of the really exciting parts is we're calling it Catalyst, and it's uh, an automated text mining tool where you build jobs of, of how to like automatedly look through all of your stuff and extract things that are in it. Um, company names, special terms, email addresses, domain names, things like this. And if, if you have a few documents, this is maybe not that revolutionary, but if you have a hundred thousand documents, that becomes very tricky. And um, you, you get really granular control. You can select which fields of a given document to, to, to extract and look through. Um, and then it saves the job, and you can rerun it later or, or, or create variations of it. Um, back to sort of the overall uh, view like this, um, the collaboration aspect, you can easily add other people who have an account on the system by simply adding their username if you click um, uh, user access and uh, they'll get an email and they'll get invited to join it. Um, and then the next step is publishing your archive, because if you want to make some of your documents public, not all of them, um, you can choose to publish them, and you can choose very specific like items, like uh, you know, just publish locations or just publish people, or, or on files, you can publish like just the text fields of a PDF, for instance, and, and then it will um, suddenly make all of the documents in your, in your instance uh, public. Um, we have some upcoming things that we're working on in the next few months. Um. Yeah, so um, we have a working test in sense that we're looking for people who are interested in testing it, but in the meantime, um, we're working on cleaning up some of what we have and also um, adding some more functionality like a browser plugin where you can just um, flag web pages to be imported as you're browsing the internet and they'll be added to the um, archive with the other documents. Um, adding in an interface or web crawlers. Um, we have been in the past, but we need to integrate it with the new platform so that people can just go and type in, say, the name of a person or the name of a company, and it downloads the data from multiple data sources and imports it into the archive automatically. Um, and probably the most important part we're going to be working on, um, because right now it's still rather centralized, so um, we're working on both the sort of legal and technical infrastructure for mirroring the data between different instances um, over the next few months. Um, bulk upload of large data sets. Um, it's possible to upload a fair bit of data from your browser, but it can start to be a bit unreliable um, when you're dealing with hundreds of gigabytes of data, so we need uh, some alternative channels for that, and encryption of um, the archive virtual machines. There are more things, but these are sort of our priorities at the moment for what we're planning to add to get to this into a state where it's widely usable. Um, but it, what we have can be used so far, so if anyone is interested and has data and is interested in making an archive like this, um, let us know. Um, there is a, um, it's a, there's a test instance available there. Um, and we can give you login information if you want. Um, and we're also looking if anyone wants to help find bugs or security issues. Um, we're still sort of at the stage where we're testing this, so let us know. All right, thank you so much. So coming at this from kind of like a social science perspective, I wanted to focus on the, the data, you know, um, and so the scope and the impact, um, the, the parameters and the results, essentially, um, for each of, of the projects. Um, and then we can get into some, some more detail stuff if we have time. Um, MC or Brennan? Um, how, how are you deciding, so you're gonna have a network of, of, of places to host these files now. Will this be kind of like Mastodon where you have um, different uh, instances where people tend to go based on their affiliations or um, will you have limitations on who, uh, what you would be willing to host your own? based on p potentially even the ideology behind the documents, or yeah, will so there be any limitations? We'll need to see, it, it's hard to predict how it will go when it expands out to ones that we're not sort of starting off. To start off with, we're start trying to start a few different hosting companies, um, and those will try to keep everything online, but um, we're trying to create a system where people can respond to pressure to take things down Obviously, it makes sense to resist to a certain point, because otherwise things won't stay online at all, but um, if it gets particularly bad in one jurisdiction, we're trying to create a system where it's okay to stay up in others. 
Um, as to how different, if it will be group specific, uh, people may, I'm guessing that people have a sort of home jurisdiction where they have their private archive hosted. The public one is mirrored between them and probably encrypted copies of the private one will be mirrored to the other ones. Um, but for the, um, it's a bit more uh, resource intensive, the private one, because it has extra tools for text mining or for OCRing documents. Um, than the public one. So it's, there'll probably be one home instance and people might choose that based on the topic of the documents. Like if they think it's data that's likely to be censored in one place, they may choose one in a different place. All right, um, so I guess I will ask for Emmanuel Freudenthal about the, the scope of your data. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, for social scientists, like observance of data and the parameters and where we look, um, like definitions, these things matter. And so I was wondering why you chose specifically the economists list of authoritarian states to select the, the leaders that would be tracked by this software. So, I mean, I, th I think a lot of people, um, pro like left progressive people, consider the economists somewhat um, promoting of a neoliberal perspective and maybe there would be some overlap between um, their list of dictators and leaders of countries that maybe they would also consider to be somewhat adversarial to Western economic interests or foreign policy agendas. So do you, th do you fear that there's any bias in that data set from the economists? <clears throat> so I guess any, um, any data where you're gonna classify a country countries along a certain list, whether it's uh, uh, corruption or anything like that, is, is going to have a bias. Any kind of uh, political analysis is going to have a bias. The, the decision to use the economist data set was, was actually prior to my involvement in the project. Um, not that I disagree with it, but uh, so I, I wasn't involved in the decision of why to use this one, but for my own use of it so far has been to this is like a third party that you can refer to instead of us sitting in a, between the two of us and going like, this thing is dictatorship. Yeah, I reckon, okay, let's add it. Um, so it's, uh, it's, an external, it's an external reference that is uh, more, way more objective than just the two of us sitting and, and deciding who is a dictator and who isn't. So is it necessarily important though to, to track dictators as opposed to just leaders? So like, why is it necessary for there to be transparency for the leaders of smaller developing um, or Eastern countries or Global South countries more necessarily than um, for Donald Trump or for Boris Johnson or Nar Narendra Modi. Um, you know, is, is there, uh, please say, um, it, shouldn't we be tracking everyone? Why is the privacy of Western leaders more important than, than for... Well, you can actually go on the ADSB Exchange website and, and track any plans that you want. Um, uh, I, I think you said uh, third world country and dictatorship, and it's actually two different things. Uh, but uh, uh, the idea is not to... The idea is to track dictator because um, there is the ones whose trip is going to be the least accountable. Like, if you want to find out where the president of the US is, maybe not at any specific point in time, but he has an agenda that you can consult, and he's not, well, um, I guess now it's things are changing a little bit, but um, he's not necessarily gonna um, take a trip to Switzerland to go and hide his money or to take a, a three months holiday on taxpayers' expenses, though, yeah. So, so that's the reason, yeah. Um. So uh, back to MC and Brennan, um, in terms of, of impact or, or results, um, of course the, the most interesting aspect of this to me, and, and I hope you guys will have some ideas about this, is um, like, what do you think the impact of OSINT tools like this will have on the media landscape? So um, if, do, do you think that this would empower independent journalists, um, smaller publishers, to be able to handle these large data sets that typically, you know, these large organizations are, are only able to handle. Do you think that that will actually potentially change the narrative around um, big stories, big leaks? Or do you think that, um, that 
there's uh, any sort of other uh, impact that, that you could foresee on the actual output of media? Not sure if I'm directly answering this, but like I, in terms I, of like content and, and narrative around a story, do you think that um, if independent publishers um, and journalists are able to publish these large data sets and analyze them properly, do you think that we might get more stories that have different narratives than than we typically do around big leaks? Do you mean in comparison to say much larger organizations and news entities? Yeah, okay. So like independent researchers could use a tool like this, and they have suddenly like a software team pretty much that can do data stuff, yeah. Hopefully, that would be a good outcome, I think. Um, then, of course, like, will, how will the public respond to that? Are the public still gonna be paying more attention to the big, you know, five or whatever, big two publications in their given country, the Guardian, the this, the that? Um, or are they gonna be like, ah, this, you know, independent site has a lot of really good quality data journalism that's like founded in, in like really solid evidence. Hopefully, there'll be a, a rising public uh, awareness of that. Yeah, I'm hoping so. Um, I mean, there's definitely been more smaller groups of activists or independent researchers or freelance journalists who have uh, been trying to build databases of large amounts of content like this. So I'm hoping that that will increase over time and there'll be more people doing that. Um, also, just the effect of having data available online means that more people can go on and later reference it and use it, um, and use it to check facts or verify stories, and use it to um, find new things. So I think that that will also have an impact on um, citizen journalism, even if people aren't using it to build archives themselves, as long as they're using, even if they're using it just to reference the archives that people have built. Okay, great. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, Emmanuel, what um, what do you th what are you wanting people to do with with the data that's that's produced by the spot? Like, um, are there ways that they can look deeper into this data, or like, what's what's the purpose? Should they be um, like contacting their leaders to let them know about things? Should they be um, posting, you know, additionally online about it, or what are you hoping that comes out of it? Um, so I. If for me, as a journalist, my, my role is just to publish the thing and then people can do whatever they want with it. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the citizens of those countries that are on the list, there's no way they can do actually anything, basically. Like if you go in and protest in Equatorial Guinea or in Cameroon about your president, I mean, obviously everyone, like everyone's aware of what they're doing and their mismanagement and stuff. But, you know, if you go out and protest, you're going to end up in jail or shot. So, so I don't expect them to be, to, to be doing that. Uh, I think the pressure, in a way, is uh, more likely to come on, on the countries where, where those leaders go. Uh, you know, for example, in, in, in Switzerland, in Geneva, where um, Paul Bia sometimes spent like a third of his year. Uh, you, you, you'd think that the citizen of that country might ask questions of why do we let this guy come in and, and uh, spend millions of dollars in, a, in, a, in Geneva. Um, and same thing for, for other leader. Recently, the president of Congo Brazzaville went to France and spent, uh, I think, a couple of weeks there, or like a long week. And same thing, you know, like no one's been asking, well, very few people have been asking questions about, you know, this can, should we, should we house this guy? Should we allow him to come? And so in a way, the, um, the transparency that we bring on, on, uh, on the travel might lead the citizen of the country that, where, where those people are spending their money and also quite often the countries where, like in France, for example, has uh, for a long time support or um, helped a lot of these uh, West African dictatorships uh, or the dictators stay in power. So a lot of the citizens of those countries, or some of the citizens of, of, the, of France, for example, might ask questions about what France um, is doing in those countries and what relationship it has with, with those uh, heads of state. Um, so, I wanted to kind of go a little off um, topic here and, and ask, you know, you're mentioning this, that you don't want to become a, a single point of failure and um, you don't want to have this 
uh, these data sets too centralized. Um, but even if one were to have data sets in different places uh, on different networks for themselves, um, I'm really wondering if you're comfortable talking about the chilling effect that uh, the fate of Julian Assange for publishing documents could have on someone um, who, who wants to publish documents now and also then hosting them centrally, what kind of uh, thought process that, that brings of, of the situation at this point? Yeah, I think it's a serious issue. There have been a lot of threats to journalism, actually, especially in Western countries lately, more than um, there have been in a long time, I think. And so it's, I think, quite important to try to um, make it okay to publish data like this and make it acceptable. Um, but I think it's also important to ensure that it's still possible to do this, even if it isn't acceptable in certain jurisdictions to do it. Um, so I think it's multiple things need to be done. All right, um, and you see, so I'm, I'm wondering, will, will you be tracking um, other leaders shortly? Because like, for instance, with, um, with the, this, this question of misappropriation of funds and so forth, I mean, we have a situation, I think, where maybe if one of these antennas was just looking for blocked um, planes, in um, Scotland where Donald Trump was um, having some military, uh, like some soldiers from the US um, inappropriately staying at, at hotels of his, this, this would also kind of really fit into what it seems like you're going after. And so, um, yeah, I'm wondering like, is, is there any intention to, to track everyone, so uh, all of them? To the um, at the moment, not really, because the project's been about dictators so far. Um, the, the ADSB Exchange website does collect all of the information. Uh, I guess the, um, I mean, this is something we can think about, whether it would be worthwhile tracking all of the heads of state. Yeah, my, my uh, feeling at the moment is that, you know, those where there's the biggest gap in accountability, except maybe Trump, uh, are, are the leaders of dictatorships, yeah. And because all the other ones, if you, if you actually look, you know, uh, it's it, like Trump doesn't disappear easily. Um, sure, but, but Trump doesn't work alone within the government, you know, and so, I'm, I mean, I think that there's, that there's also this, this question of, of narrative setting when there seems to be a double standard for different countries, you know. Um, what do and you so mean? I'm, I'm just like, so there's, there's no plan to, to track Western leaders? No, no, but like I said, you can, you can if you have the um, tail number or, or the hex number of any airplane, you can go on the ADSB exchange website and track it. Um, yeah, because like, for example, if, if you think there's two, um, how many countries around the world? Like 250? Mm -hmm. So imagine each of those countries has say like five planes, that's already at uh, 1,250 planes that you're gonna be tracking. So if you have a Twitter bot that tracks that many planes, uh, you know, the, the interest uh, is, is lower. So it's a bit like, um, you know, on the Flight Aware website, there's a bunch of interesting planes, like the BuzzFeed investigations shown. So, but you can't see them because there's so many other planes. So that would be a, a maybe a downside plus all the work that would be uh, required to, uh, you know, uh, list all those planes. So then the next time, uh, you know, we won't have a, a comprehensive list of all the planes of all the countries in the world, and people are going to ask us wh why didn't you, you know, uh, why is there no planes from Suriname? Or something? Well, well, yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's it's a little different when when you know you're defining specific leaders, and they the, they do tend to be the ones that you know, about the U.S. In, in, their, in their policies, so it's... What do you mean? Um, so, in terms of this list, it does include most countries that the U.S. Is rather, has a rather ad adversarial relationship with. And so it seems that it could potentially be either useful for um, their intelligence communities or just doing the work for them, essentially just making it easier, because of course they could do this on their own. Um, but it also kind of 
um, promotes this narrative, this idea that there should be double standards, that there are dictators and there are good leaders. And of course, the good leaders include the leaders of the UK and the United States and you know, many Western countries, regardless of who those leaders are. So it's not a matter of, of actually um, engaging with a situation. It's a matter of uh, defining places and peoples and others as other, you know, and as deserving of scrutiny above and beyond uh, what we share among ourselves. Um, um, is there so still time? Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll have uh, questions in a moment. Right, we'll, we will have questions in a moment. Right. Okay, then you can ask your question in a moment. And how, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so I will open it now for questions from the audience. Um, yeah, so um, if we could have Mike over here. Okay, so, uh, and uh, could, could you um, provide your name and your question? Okay, my name's Naomi, um, and my question is for for you, Shannon, I think, and also for, for Emmanuel, that sometimes the, the best can become the enemy of the good. And that we get into these states where we are so caught up with the idea that, that we, we've, we've got a framework, so where, the, where this Twitter bot is not gathering information on one set of people and then should be, we think it should be another, a group of people and then we put an interpretation onto it, uh, we can end up in a state where sometimes the liberal left wing just completely misses the point. So my question is, is there a way of having this conversation without getting caught up with, you must do more, but actually how can we make best use of what is being done and possibly not frame things in such a way that we render things either problematic or redundant because it doesn't fit a mindset that we've got ourselves caught up into. Was that for me as well? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I would actually consider these questions to be very important and these questions to have been ignored for a very long time. And because of the fact that uh, so much of the media is so oversaturated with um, a very narrow frame of uh, ideology and worldview, this being mainstream media, corporate media, which dominates. This does need to be challenged where and when it can by those who consider this important. Um, I'm not demanding that you open your data set at all. I mean, I, it's just, it's a question of parameters to me. And so I feel that social scientists and journalists should certainly be able to um, justify and explain the parameters where they look because we know that this is what leads to bias and what leads to uh, sweeping under the rug of bias when it reinforces a ruling class ideology. Um, I think, I mean, it's, it's good that you raise those questions in terms of the bias of the list. If, if um, you know, if the list has a bias, then the discussion should be, you know, what, what's the bias of the list? There's basically two questions there. One is, is the, is the list an accurate representation of the countries that are, are the most totalitarian and the least transparent and the most corrupt? So that's one question. And then, then maybe there's a, you know, a radical left-wing list of dictatorships that everyone agrees on. Um, which I, I kind of doubt. And then, um, then the other question is whether you should only track dictatorships or whether you should track all of the countries. I personally think there's quite a big difference even, uh, you know, I, I, certainly uh, I think all leaders should be held to a, a high degree of accountability. And like I said, the data is actually open. You can go on the ADSB web exchange website and track whatever plan you want. So it's not like we're hiding any data. You can actually go and do it. So, uh, but I think there is a, a difference, like quite a serious difference between uh, dictatorships like Cameroon where there's just no space for, for any kind of, um, 
meaningful contestation and, and uh, countries that do end up on the democracy side of the economist index, no matter how flawed that democracy, democracy might be, uh, I think there's like a serious uh, difference and we should, yeah. Thanks. Okay, and more questions? Um, sir, in the middle, right here. Okay, it's just quick. I mean, I think there's a misunderstanding of what these kinds of platforms are supposed to do. It's not a way of harassing people or of like lashing out by saying, yeah, we're following you. It's, it's not that. It's, um, it's literally just about collecting evidence and making that evidence accessible to people who might either use them to conduct a journalistic investigation who might even use them in a prosecution. If we have flight data on a dictator from West Africa who is visiting Switzerland, then prosecutors in Switzerland could use that data to, to mount an investigate, a prosecution that could actually lead to real change. This is why these platforms are useful. It's, it's not about harassing people. It's not about following them, stalking them, or whatever. If we were to collect flight data on Trump's plane, we would gain nothing. As the panelist said, this is already public. It's, it's not about finding new ways to harass Donald Trump, as much as I dislike him. It's about providing a useful service. This is, this is what these people are doing. I think it's a mistake to turn them into as much as I engage in activism myself, it's a mistake to try to turn them into platforms for activism or platforms for making a point. That's not what it's about. It's literally about collecting evidence. There's nothing sort of um, political about it. It's just about, about evidence. Yeah, I, I think that this is, uh, I'm assuming that Sorry, to speak back. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is what we often hear from um, the media and uh, all sorts of establishment perspectives is that, no, there is no bias. I couldn't possibly be biased. I'm just but looking at I'm the... But I'm just, I'm a guy from one of these countries. I don't work for mainstream media. I am just a person from a corrupt country. And so, I am so telling am I. you that we're doing this, <laughs> not because we want to harass, like, it's not about that. It's, no, it's I, literally yeah. about accountability. I, I'm sorry if it's... Um, there is a if, major it, difference between the, the US as a country and my country. As, as many problems as the US has, there is still a high level of accountability. There's a massive difference. It's, it, there's simply no comparison. And regarding dictatorships, I mean, that's sort of a, the subject of scientific study. It's not some inherent bias or something like that. Of course, there's a, a structural difference between a country that's a dictatorship and one that isn't. This is sort of something that's commonly accepted. It's not a question of cultural bias or anything like that. It's, it's systems. They are structurally different. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, I think we had another question here. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Fatin, and um, well, I have so many things to say, but um, the the basically uh, what I have trouble understanding is. Um, why are people so much against thinking about what, what words mean and who has a monopoly over terms and what these mean to us? So I, I, do, I am having like a problem understanding why it's called dictator alert and what does dictator mean and who is telling us what dictator means and why, why are we considering the US to be less corrupt than, I don't know, Malta or Egypt where I'm from? Um, and why are we considering them, that Trump is not a dictator and not worth calling a dictator? So there's always been a monopoly over 
these terms and, and it's always been Western driven and, and this adds to the problem. So I agree very much that calling it dictator alert and the two examples we're giving are we're giving by African um, leaders who are not dictators because they became dictators on their own. They're actually dictators because of the good countries like the US and the UK and the less corrupt countries as people claim. So um, it's just a bit, uh, it's also a bit sensitive and a bit, and it makes me a bit also very emotional because um, I come from a place in the world where I'm being put in boxes all the time and um, these, these types of initiatives do add to stereotypes that I'm facing every day. So it is very personal um, and it is very emotional and, and it, it's, not, it's not being objective and saying this is a good project or, or it's a bad project. It's a good project if it's used properly. But the way it's branded, it's on the wrong foot right from the start. It's just, it, 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 it's, not, it's not objective from the start even. So when are we being objective? When we are calling the project something or then when we are challenging that, the pro that actually the project is, the name of the project is not very objective. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions? And hopefully we can go back to questions. Questions. <laughs> I mean, m maybe I can I can address that. Um, so I'm, I'm not um, I'm not opposed at all to, to discussing you know the what's a dictator, what's a dictatorship, and, and of course, you know, it is subjective to some extent, um, but I, I do think there are differences in different countries. I mean, if you, if you talk about corruption, you talk about, uh, you know, uh, freedom of expression and, and so on, and like ha as bad as uh, uh, US politics uh, or, or French politics might be, I don't think it's comparable to some of the countries that are on the list. No, no, it's, no, that's the whole point. That's why we use the index, so that it's not my subjective view. So, um, uh, I'm, uh, so, so, I mean, the, like, so, uh, so there's there's um, there's two questions there, right? One question is whether, uh, well, it's three questions, I guess. One, do you believe there's such a thing as a dictatorship or it's all, every country is, is a, a country and everything is, is subjective and relative and the corruption in one country is no different than the corruption or the freedom of speech in another country. And I think in terms of uh, uh, thinking about words, we use words as label and of course it has the limitations. And so it's not like, you know, like, uh, France has a massive issue with corruption as well, and like you said, you know they also perpetuate corruption in, in those uh, uh, most of the countries that have um, uh, presented about the, the three stories um, that at the start. So, so it's not like those are countries without problems. Um, but then, if we if we decide to use words as labels, then at some point, uh, you know, something is something and something is not something. So there is countries that you'll call dictatorships and countries that you call non-dictatorships or something else, like semi-dictatorship, I don't know. So uh, uh, as, when you decide to use words to, to name things, then you're going to run into problems at some point or another. And then the question is, you know, do we have a debate about what's a dictatorship, what isn't a dictatorship, which countries falls into it, which country doesn't fall into it, and so on, and, and so we decided to use an economist uh, index. You know, ob obviously it's biased, and uh, you know, um, uh, like anything is biased, but that's actually an external thing, and we can have a discussion about which other list might be less biased, or which other criteria might be less biased, but I do think, um, I'd, as a single person, uh, I don't want to be the one making the decision this is a dictatorship or not, uh, because I'm not the right guy for that, and also I don't, you know, I don't want to sit uh, every day going like, okay, which is a, which countries become a dictatorship today? Uh, so, uh, so once you once you decide to use these words and then classify some countries in dictatorship or not, and use some kind of external reference for that, uh, then I think you end up in the situation where we are, where you know, you, you'll have some countries that are branded dictatorships because of a number of criteria that you've established. 
and then um, those are the countries that end up on the Twitter bot. Yeah. And then, yeah. I already have it. <laughs> so my name is John Brucci. I'm a research officer at Transparency International, and as it happens, I've worked quite a bit with the Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy Index. So I just wonder if anyone who's criticized the index here knows how it's computed. I'm sorry? Does anyone who criticized the index in this room know how it's computed? Uh, yeah, to some extent, I've looked into it. So there's like 22 questions. It's like a questionnaire. It's a standardized questionnaire, and they look at things like political rights, civil rights, whether you have the freedom to go and organize a protest and not be harassed for it, whether you have like, um, you know, if you get the right to a fair trial and so on and so forth. And then you go and say yes, no, zero, one, and then you count the scores, and. I mean, it makes intuitive sense when you look at the countries which are in the authoritarian kind of like bracket in the end, and that's what presumably you're using. Maybe one suggestion would be to try and combine that with other indicators. So there's the polity index, there's the, um, um, there's the varieties of democracy project which have a lot of data again on, on democracy. And the Freedom House indicator, again, freedom in the world, looking at political rights and civil rights. And as it happens, I did do the exercise of looking whether there's overlap of what the Economist, Freedom House, varieties of democracy, other indicators say, and there is a massive degree of overlap. So I don't think there's a certain bias from the Economist as a neoliberal organization. Maybe there's a certain bias in terms of what we recognize as a Western model, this Weberian model of the government. If anyone has any better ideas of how to conceptualize democracy, then you know, go with your 20 indicators, 15, Sorry, however many. Do you, have, do you have a question? If, do, if do, I, are you yeah. getting to a question? I'm, I'm, I'm clarifying. I mean, if, if there's no... If, if there's, no, if there's no value in the clarification, I can also end my point here. I also have a question. I mean, I think we should also open the floor for questions. And for I have MC a question for M MC and Brennan as well. Okay. Um, um, well, I mean, if you'd like to quickly ask that question now, that would be good. Okay, so I may not continue with my conclusion on the democracy. Okay, I mean, fine. This is, it's uh, question. The question for MC and Brendan is, um, let's assume, for example, someone takes the 2.3 terabytes of data that are contained in the Panama Papers leak. Mm -hmm. If you just took that zip folder, put it up on your archive, what would it spit out? I'm just curious to see like, what kind of um, thing So it would Thank you. extract the text from the documents and uh, load them into a searchable database, um, like a standard search engine where you can type into the box what you want. You could click on the documents and view both the original document and the text of the data. Um, so that would make it it's basically it will enable people to sort through it. There are also tools that you could use to extract, like all the people mentioned or the companies mentioned, uh, tag the documents that include certain terms, and analyze it that way. Um, but it depends on the sorts of analysis you want to do. So there is still some human analysis component that needs to be done. All right, and I think we had another question here. I'm hesitant to return back to the topic that uh, most of the Q&A has been on, but um, I, um, the, the, the Twitter account that you have is, is called the Geneva Watch, was it? Uh, or, yeah. Um, so it's focused on the Geneva airport right now. Uh, yeah. And, and do you plan to expand that to other airports, or is it uh, limited to the Geneva? Yeah, so, so that's why I presented earlier uh, that uh, it started as, um, as a Geneva uh, focused um, and a, a lot of Geneva has very good banks and uh, very discreet banks and also quite good healthcare and that's why also you get a lot of uh, leaders going there so the plus uh, you have Mike um, with his antenna there so that's why it started there is he contributing stuff to the exchange or the, the um, ADSB exchange website uh, this guy Mike in Geneva uh, like are all the things he's recording that's going into the um, uh, actually, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if he's feeding uh, ADSB exchange. Yeah, so the, probably. The Geneva collection is maybe just limited to this uh, dictator index uh, set of planes, and 
I, I think it's a really interesting project, and I would uh, encourage you to expand it. Um, and I would hopefully consider like. Um, yeah, so, the, so we're expanding next week. But I mean, like, expand Thanks it to, to more suggestion. places, uh, more, more than just the, that index, like uh, royal families and uh, powerful people besides oh, okay. uh, heads of state even. Um, uh, yeah, it's a good idea. No, I mean, and I think the uh, intervention from, um, uh, from, uh, from the, the person we spoke earlier about maybe combining different index might be, uh, might be a good idea. And obviously expanding it to, to, to other people. The thing is, you don't want, again, like, I mean, you can see how much um, uh, discussion there is about us using an index that is, you know, okay, you might think the economy biases in that way, but um, in terms of sources, uh, it's, it's a pretty well-established source. And, and there is a huge discussion now about whether we should use this index or another one and so on. So imagine if we started, you know, de decreeing that uh, uh, this guy should be followed and, and not this guy, then uh, we might run into problems. And again, um, this, all of the data is available online. So if, if you actually want to follow someone specific, you can actually do that. Yeah. Um, any more? There's a question here. Uh, hi, my question is for MC and Brennan. Um, so for the for the Looking Less project. Um, you know, as, as, it, as is the case with any technology or any open source project, one could use it basically for a different number of purposes. So given that you provided a hosted solution as well, um, what's your policy towards, uh, or how you, what is the process around, let's say someone comes on and instead of doing like a, an IC watch kind of project, does a, like dumps a bunch of data that, you know, exposes a number of investigative journalists or activists or something like that. So um, how, how do you, what are your thought process around how are you going to have a, you know, would you censor it, would you moderate it, how is it going, how is it going to work? So that's a tricky question. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think there's any one good solution to it because if we enable ourselves to censor things, then we can be pressured to censor more things. So to, we're going to try to make it technically difficult for us to make that decision. Um, that said, we're not going to be actively promoting it to people who would do that. Um, so while people could, of course, log in and register and use it for that, that's not something that we would try to promote. Um, we're considering maybe having just like some statement of these, this is what we hope people do with it, but um, we also want to make it so that we can't really do much more to control it just because um, the, it's difficult to figure out where to draw the line once you start drawing a line, so that's the tricky problem. All right, so we only have a couple more minutes, so I'll take some last questions. We have one here. Um, I, I also think it's a great project, and um, you talked about expansion. Um, aren't you afraid it's like going to be like an arms race that the dictators or the people that you want to track uh, going to react to that or because you also talked about the blocked airplanes or um, I didn't get the point how easily it could be done so without um, making anything secret here your secret future plans are public but do you think it's going to be an arms race you can still track them in the future uh, well I mean it's it's uh, it is already an arms race in, in many ways so the um, uh, what I was explaining with the blocking is, is the other websites like Flight Radar and uh, Flight Aware, which has a, a bigger websites, the commercial websites. They're already filtering uh, out a lot of the airplanes, probably half or so, and all of the military planes as well, which ADSB Exchange doesn't. So, um, and the reason they do that is uh, because they don't want to have. Uh, basically, they don't want to ha run into troubles because they'll, um, you know, with the Federal Aviation Authority and so on. I mean, so far there's not been any lawsuit or anything like that, but that's probably the reason they're, they're uh, censoring that data in terms of the data that comes out um, on the website. So, in terms of the arm race that might happen once we disclose this information, I mean, you, you, you could argue the same with, uh, with the Panama Papers, you know. Obviously, these guys are going to use more sophisticated means of hiding, and instead of reg registering one shell company with uh, uh, Mossack Fonseca, you might register one shell company that owns another one that owns another one, so one leak can't expose you. And basically, for planes, it's, it's uh, quite similar. The, um, 
you, you can own a plane by a series of shell companies that makes it quite hard to know that you're the owner. So obviously the difference with a plane is that at some point you need to actually get in the plane and fly somewhere, whereas uh, you don't really, like it's not visible in the real world with a shell company if you're using a shell company. You don't, you know, people can't see you next to that shell company <laughs> because uh, it's just a shell company. So whereas with a plane, you're gonna be next to that plane. And like we've seen, uh, or you, <laughs> Um, with uh, Obiang, you actually post it on in Instagram so you can see, oh, okay, he's using that specific plane. Um, that said, the other, so in terms of hiding uh, ownership, that's already what's being done. In terms of um, uh, hiding the tracking, the Federal Aviation Authority in the US is actually uh, planning to implement some kind of, um, so I don't know exactly technically how it's gonna work, but basically, uh, temporary registration number. So today you're flying with uh, registration A, uh, tomorrow on you, or even the same day on your next flight, your registration B. So it basically becomes impossible to know that this plane is the same as the plane yesterday. So they're actually gonna implement that in the US. But uh, in the rest of the world so far, that hasn't happened. Um, and the other uh, mitigation measures that people might uh, use to, to not show up on a website like ADSB Exchange would be to uh, turn off the ADSB um, in the plane or, or uh, go on a mode that doesn't provide as much information, which we already see uh, people like Obiang, for example, doing, because every, um, every jurisdiction has, has a different needs. So some jurisdiction, you might need to give more information than others, so as they, they can switch from one to the other. So that's another way of, uh, of hiding yourself. And then, of course, you can just not fly with your private plane. Uh, you can just take a regular plane. Um, this is always the advice I can give if, if any of you wants to uh, <laughs> uh, hide your, uh, your trips with your private plane. So there you go. You know how to do it now. All right. So uh, we are a little over time now, but I did promise one question. So take this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question to MC. Uh, so, uh, in the workflow that you were explaining and how the, the software should be working, there is so much dependency on OCR as a technology. Uh, and I was thinking that uh, OCR is not as much as developed with the right-to-left languages. So, any, 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 any initiatives or projects that is uh, based on Farsi or Hindi or Arabic or things like that, the OCR will fail terribly versus the right to left uh, languages. I'm not sure if in your thinking process, how can this technology or this initiative be more friendly towards the right to left uh, languages and other countries where yeah. it's not based on, left to, on right to left. Yeah, so that's definitely an issue. And if people have projects like that and contact us, we can try to add support for that. We did um, a while ago look at the possibility of adding support for languages where there isn't great OCR support. In some of those cases, there are academics that are working on some sort of prototypes for how OCR could work better on those languages. So in some cases, we may be able to incorporate that, but it really depends on the language and the work that's been done. Um, so things that may not be um, supported by the widespread o use OCR software. There may be options, but it may also not be ideal. Um, in some cases, you could manually transcribe documents, but that's obviously very work intensive, but um, the way that you can edit documents does make that more feasible than it would be, so that it provides a platform where people could um, correct OCR or otherwise edit it. Right, and uh, we had one more. Hi, just a quick question. First, thank you for being here and for making these tools that make it a lot easier for journalists to access evidence without having to code intensively. Um, my big question is, so ideally these, were, these tools were created for journalists all over the world to use and surface potentially latent stories. Um, how do you get the word out about these, uh, these tools but then also obviously without kind of jeopardizing the tool itself such that the people in power who are, you know, who are called out uh, don't have backlash against the tools themselves. Yeah, so that's something we're still figuring out. We're trying to go fairly gradually. Um, we've been working on this for a while, but if only this is, I guess, the second time we've spoken about it at all. So we've been sort of picking events. We've mostly been talk speaking at smaller events um, about this, hoping to get an initial group of test users to work out the software, and then by the time it's more widely used, we're hoping that we'll have um, a bit more of a distributed infrastructure set up in more places so that it is difficult to just easily go and 
have it taken down, but it'll take some time. All right, well, thank you all so much uh, for coming and, and seeing the, uh, the panel and for engaging in a lively discussion with us. Um, coming up shortly is gonna be an investigation with Robert Trafford, um, but uh, until then, uh, thank you guys so much, and please give me, uh, help me give a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, I also want to remind you that we will do a workshop tomorrow with Emmanuel, uh, tracking planes. Maybe now we'll start tracking the Trump plane. Who knows? <laughs> uh, and uh, so just wanted to say that uh, there will be still two spots uh, left. So if people want to join the workshop tomorrow, uh, please register. And uh, then we will meet again in 15 minutes, uh, uh, speaking about uh, the work of forensic architecture and open source intelligence with Robert Trefford. Thank you.